So uh, this is, uh, my name is uh, Ben Marks and um, here with, with Sunday and we're going to talk about adopting Elixir. We'll just give like a quick introduction uh, for ourselves and then we'll go into some questions. And we have, um, we sent out a survey to the community a few weeks ago and got back some interesting questions from them. Um, so we're going to try to incorporate our own sort of perspective on this along with the community. And then, you know, please ask questions as, as we go along and we will um, answer them, you know, in the last few minutes as we go. Um, so yeah, so um, I've been, you know, programming with uh, an Elixir for about six or six years now. Um, wrote a book with Bruce and Jose called Adopting Elixir, which is really great. Um, and because it was a way for me to get to know, to get to uh, get to know both Jose and Bruce and to for us to put our unique perspectives on how we view the language and, and how we've used it. Um, and then now I work at a company called Subspace and you can see the sort of little, little uh, plug above uh, where we have like a, a dynamic global low latency network that some of the biggest games in the world use and that we're opening up to you know developers and others later this year. Um, so if that's interesting to you, check it out. And then I'll turn it over to Sunday and uh, her introduction. Hi, my name is Sundi. I am a developer at SmartLogic, a custom web and mobile development shop based out of Baltimore, although we are fully remote now. Um, I am also a co-host on the Elixir Wizards podcast. So um, this last season, season five of the Elixir Wizards podcast, we have primarily been talking about adopting Elixir, uh, which is why I really wanted to have this conversation. I've been talking with a lot of people over the last you three, three, four months, I think, uh, different companies, different levels uh, from engineers to CTOs about what it took to get them to adopt Elixir and also, um, you know, what it was like onboarding, uh, changing their process um, and all of those different fun stories. So I just wanted to share that with everyone in the community in case it was helpful to anybody. A lot of people are looking to move into Elixir and I'm just really excited to be able to share those stories with you. Um, and also as a small little plug in uh, the summer, um, SmartLogic is looking to host a small uh, conference, um, an Elixir Wizards conference. So please stay tuned for more information on that. Um, if you follow follow us on Twitter, we'll be updating more. Thank you. Cool, yeah, so, so let's get started. We're just gonna do a sort of a round robin thing here and, and, and go with some of uh, our questions. Um, and I think one of the interesting things uh, when, you know, when Sunday and I first talked about doing this was, you know, with the, with the book, like I could only write about my perspective and Jose and Bruce could only write about their perspectives, but Sunday has like a, a perspective um, from the Elixir Wizards uh, season of getting to, to hear all these different companies and different levels, like Sunday was saying. So, you know, from, from that, like, I think if you're not already using Elixir or you're considering use it, like well, how would you convince like internal stakeholders um, that Elixir is worth it versus a conventional choice or, or a more ubiquitous choice? For a language. Yeah, so this one, this one came up quite a bit over the season. Um, I think one of the first things that we heard um, people kept in mind was what do the developers want? It's always a good move from leadership standpoint, CTO, VP of engineering to really take a look at their engineering team, ask the engineering team. I've personally been on an engineering team where we had to change technologies and they were happy to ask everybody on the engineering team what they thought our next move should be. Um, developer happiness is like a super real thing and forcing all of your engineers into one technology is no fun. So uh, I think like first step, make sure everybody wants to move to Elixir. Um, and of course they will, so that's probably not a problem. Um, but you know, um, are you moving from a greenfield project uh, or are you using a greenfield project? Are you going into a brand new thing? No legacy code whatsoever, or are you migrating things over? Are people looking towards Elixir because they're interested in it? Um, those are all things that technical stakeholders have to keep in mind. Um, as for like a quick win kind of convincing point for VPs, um, nobody wants to have like an extensive on-call situation. Elixir applications generally do not fail in production. Um, I used to say that I can't say this confidently because I had only worked in one production environment, but at this point at, um, in the season, We've heard that number uh, a number of times um, on the season for multiple companies. It's just that Elixir is really uh, set up to make it so that it works. It, it, you can deploy and not worry about it too much and not get that 3 a.m. call. So in general, um, that's something that is a good point to make for technical stakeholders. Yeah, I think that's been similar to my experience as well. I mean, I think that it's, not not terribly unreasonable to expect people to not want to try something new like you know when we at 
at VR when we or Bleacher Report when we moved over uh, to Elixir, it was it was a very gradual process, and it was first it was again like like Sandy mentioned, like having having a core of people who are interested in the language is, is very uh, important because otherwise you're just going to you know be pushing against people who don't want to do something. Um, but over time, we were able to convince people who didn't want to learn the language that it was worth learning, and some of those reasons were because like new services were being in, written in Elixir. Um, the exciting things were being done in Elixir. So if you wanted to maintain sort of a legacy system, which I would say a lot of people don't enjoy doing that, even though it's you know, a pretty critical part of general you know, architectural um, maintenance or you know, uh, the life cycle of the architecture. Um, and I think also one of the, the, the things that, was, that came up over and over again is sort of a, somewhat of a knock on Elixir was that you know, when you go to like GRPC, if you use GRPC or if you use Kafka, these kind of things, if you go to their webpage, you see that um, like Go, you know, C Sharp, et cetera, are listed as first class citizens and finding these libraries for Elixir aren't necessarily there. Um, but the libraries do exist and we can talk about a little bit more uh, about what that means in a minute. Um, but those, those are some of the, the conversations that we've had, you know, at Elixir Report when deciding with the language and also at Subspace where we decided from the beginning that Elixir was a core component of, of our architecture. Um, yeah. And I think another point that people ask are also just like real quick on the business side, um, you can usually scale faster and cheaper in Elixir. A lot of the ways that people bring Elixir into their projects is by building a quick MVP, making a proof of concert, uh, sorry, proof of concept, and then proving Elixir's worth. So you spend a few weeks on a small Elixir project, it's not a lot of developer time and therefore not a lot of money. Um, and then you usually see a pretty quick payoff. So from a business perspective, if you're saving money, uh, nobody's really gonna argue with that one. Uh, so that's usually how I kind of talk about it from the business side. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think it also depends on the scale that you have. Like if you have a small company, then maybe you're not gonna see great savings on the number of servers. You know, if you have like one Heroku Dino or whatever, you're probably not going to save a lot of money, but um, definitely at you know, VR, we did save a lot of money. And one of the nice things, of course, is the multi-core multi, multi -core support that Erlang and Elixir have had for, for quite a while now, so that you can see that you're actually using all the cores that you pay for. Um, and in other languages, even though they have they may have you know, multi-threaded support, it, it's, that, it's not as seamless as it has been with, with Beam. Um, and then going back to something that Sunny said at the beginning was, um, was dealing with like error handling and you know, fault tolerance or, or just general failure of your services. Um, one of the problems that you know that we had at, when we first started with Elixir was that you know we were new to the language and this was like in 2015, so there weren't really any Elixir how-to guides or you know very rudimentary. But the, the, you know Phoenix and Elixir were changing quite a lot, um, so we sort of had to develop our own coding style and these kind of things. And even though the code wasn't necessarily you know, great, and even you know looking back at it later, I'm like this is you know it's not good code. Um, it still performed. And that didn't mean that it didn't have errors. It just means that because of this revision structure, we were able to recover from those errors. So it, it really did save uh, save uh, people being on call from being paged all the time to the fact that you know we, it, it made life a lot easier for those on call. Yeah, absolutely. And then, oh, and then also one other thing about, you know, even if you are a small company or, or starting out from scratch or, or greenfielding a project, um, the iteration time for Elixir is quite fast, I feel like. I, like if, you know, no matter the project that I was doing, if there had to be some sort of cloud inter interface or some sort of, you know, website at all, then I would probably use Elixir because you could do it just as fast as the other frameworks um, and then have all of the niceties that the Beam has to offer. Uh, the next thing that we, we saw a lot of questions on uh, were what are some hiring and onboarding tips that we have for Elixir developers? So from both the um, hiring Elixir developer side and as an Elixir developer who's looking for a job. Um, and thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, I think there's a big disservice when we look for job, when we have job postings for Elixir companies that require you to have Elixir experience. Um, because, you know, I don't know how many people over the years, over the last six years that have hired for Elixir roles or had a part in that interview, but a, a minority of them were experienced or even, you know, familiar Elixir developers. Um, we generally, at, you know, at both Subspace and at Bleacher Report, we've 
the goal was to find people who you know can think critically and you know what that means in practice is how would you design an API, how would you design the system, these kind of things, and then learn learn the language later. Um, because it is it is pretty quick to learn. Um, you know, I, like it, it varies on your domain, of course, and what kind of skills skills you need. And you know, if you're building a distributed system and you have to worry about these things, you should, it probably helps to have someone who has some experience with distributed systems and understanding understand that part. But learning the language itself is it, it has not been a barrier to entry. Um, and you know, in fact, at Subspace, I'm the only one who has had any Elixir experience before this job. And we have six people on the Elixir, on sort of the distributed systems team. And only one of them had Erlang experience. And this was like from seven or eight years ago. And so they're like, oh, a lot has changed since R18, right? You know, and the same with like, oh, what is this with? Oh, polymorphism. Oh, this is really cool. Um, but the point of that is that before I was hired, the people who had no experience with Elixir built out the first version of our system and deployed it to production and had like actual live traffic running on it, um, which I think is a pretty remarkable accomplishment on their part, but also uh, is a testimony to sort of the uh, ease at which you can sort of go into the uh, beam of ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is, is this is something we hear all the time is just like, um, can the company who's building an Elixir um, scale an Elixir in, in, in terms of resources, in terms of their team? Um, management often can be concerned about hiring for Elixir. Um, I have it on good authority from like a number of recruiters who say that hiring for Elixir is actually not that hard, um, not any harder than any other niche language. Um, I've actually heard from some people that it's actually a little easier because there's an actual community of people and it's easy to identify uh, folks. I know like in the Elixir Lang Slack, for example, we have a jobs channel. Um, usually folks are really tuned in to when they're looking for an Elixir job. So finding Elixir engineers is not usually an issue, but I think that the flip side of that coin is, should you only be hiring Elixir engineers? Is just, the answer is probably no. If we're talking about adopting Elixir, you really want to get diversity of thought. And so that isn't just people from all walks of life. That is also people from different languages. It is a really good way to diversify your skill set to have somebody join the team who's interested in learning Elixir, who has experience in another language, especially if it's another niche language. You get so many different perspectives um, and it's just a much more interesting kind of conversation to have. If everybody learned the same way in the same language, if we were all Elixir engineers, I mean, yeah, that can be fun, but um, you get more challenging thoughts uh, when you actually diversify your team that way. So when management's concerned about hiring, um, I, I'm using this phrasing because I see the question in the, uh, in the, chat, uh, in the chat there. Um, I, I would say that it's not hard to find Elixir engineers if you know where to look um, and you should be happy to train. And so kind of on the onboarding side of it, there's a question about uh, training and whatnot. Um, pair programming has been a tried and true way. I think uh, Randall mentioned this yesterday. Uh, pair programming is like one of the best ways to really ramp up a new engineer on, on Elixir. Um, I think a lot of us kind of agree with that. I have heard that from numerous folks on who've come on the pod podcast. Uh, a few people mentioned books and training courses, but a lot of them mentioned pair programming. Um, and then I think the third thing that I, I, we're going to touch on this later a little bit, but the third thing I really wanted to, to make sure I, I mentioned in the hiring in the hiring space is that um, junior engineers are are not often hired in the Elixir space, and maybe just in general not being hired that often right now because with the remote kind of onboarding process that we have, a lot of people are nervous about it. Um, I heard a lot of companies say that they had trouble hiring or they didn't feel comfortable hiring junior engineers because they had some product they have to build right now, or they have to make it to market by this date, or they have some uh, deadline that they need to hit. So they need to move quickly. Um, and I just want to remind everyone and kind of point out that just because you have a team of senior engineers does not mean you're going to move quickly, even if you're writing an Elixir. Uh, senior engineers can make mistakes. Um, I can say from experience that it is quite possible to have a, a team of mixed level of skill sets, junior, mid, senior, move just as quickly, if not faster, sometimes than a team of senior engineers. So if you're hiring, I just want to point that out there. 
if there is a, a senior engineer who's able to um, kind of lay out the architecture or a software architect lay out the architecture of what that application should look like and they ticket it well and they write really good acceptance criteria, you go from a testing first environment, it's quite possible to move your team forward with a, a junior engineer. Yeah, it was, it was actually funny. Well, maybe not funny is not the right word, but when Sunday and I were first talking about that, she said, uh, you know, you don't need senior year engineers if you're just starting out a startup. And I was like, no, maybe you do. But then, of course, like our the company where I work now, we, we didn't have senior engineers, at least not in Elixir, and they built a prototype really quickly and it performed really, really well. Um, so that was that was something that, you know, that immediately sort of reassessed my perspective on that. Um, and I think also the point of, of whether you build something fast or build something good, like if you, you know, if you're building out an MVP product or, or Greenfield product, you're probably, you know, you can plan all you want, but probably that product isn't going to look the same in six months or years it does now because, or, or, or it's just stagnated. And then what's the point of continuing to develop on it? Because, you know, the, the product evolves. And as you learn more about how the product behaves in production and the customers use it, then you'll, of course, refine it over time. And whether you're a, a senior engineer or a less experienced engineer, you'll figure out those same lessons in, in different ways, I feel like. You know, and then I think one of the things also that 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 Sandy and I talked about um, was, you know, how if you if you are like new to Elixir or you know new programmer in general, like what is the responsibility of the company? Like if they're willing to hire you, are they going to say like, well, well, you know, we expect you to work forty hours, but you need to teach yourself by whatever mechanism outside of work? I mean, that's that's a red flag, right? Like. You know the the labor movements eight 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 you know eight hours of work eight hours of leisure and eight hours of sleep is something that even if I don't live by that I think we should strive towards that or you know or maybe like less work but not more leisure um, and making sure that that you put yourself in the like the company like it's a two, two two sided relationship where the company is responsible for providing the resources you need to learn within the time frame of the workday not outside of work you know I think that's a, a really, really important thing to for people who are getting into Elixir or hiring people for Elixir to understand and to practice. Yeah, and I think the last thing I really want to drive home on this is we're talking about adopting Elixir. We love this language. We want to spread this language to more people. We want more people to see it and use it. And we can't necessarily do that if we're only spreading it to a very specific subset of people, which is an engineer with a certain number of years of experience. So. It's just something to keep in mind as we try to let everyone adopt Elixir. Yeah, I think, um, and sort of continuing with that, I think this is a good question for Sunday. So like, you know, and, and as we talked about this a little bit um, when we first met, but uh, from your experience or, you know, to a wider audience, if you were, you know, just, just interested in programming or, um, you know, what considered a career as programming, would you, would Elixir be your first language? Would you recommend that as a first language or would you say, or would you recommend something else? There are two sides to this. A lot of people will say that the big languages are better to start off with, like in college, they're teaching Java and C, and then in the advanced classes, they're teaching Ruby. Um, boot camps, they're usually teaching the most popular languages, Ruby, JavaScript, um, to allow people to quickly find a job when they leave. So that is something to consider. Um, how how quickly do you need to find a job? Um, especially because I mean, as sad it is it as it is, the Elixir community is currently not really hiring junior engineers. Um, I take um, a lot of calls with different people just to kind of understand their their hiring right now and to see just check check in. Are you hiring any junior engineers? And I uh, overwhelmingly hear uh, that they're not. So I can't recommend it from that point of view. From a personal point of view, I actually was a computer science major for like five seconds um, and it didn't work out for me. Java was not a great first language. Uh, JavaScript was not a good like first language to be using for me at least when I was learning. I think Elixir would have clicked better. I think Elixir would have been a better first language for me from an understanding standpoint, from making more progress by myself. Um, I felt a lot like I had to rely on other people in my, my computer science classes and then like on the job. I did a lot of pair programming I don't feel like was necessary. I think I personally would have been better off as, as learning Elixir as a first language, but you have to think about what you're trying to accomplish with what language you're trying to learn. And there's a lot of information out there for beginners. So it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, I think, I mean, for my 
personal experience, like I didn't study computer science, I studied philosophy and economics. And, um, and when I left college, I was like, oh, I have a lot of debt to pay. I'm never going to pay this off. How can I pay this off? And so it was a very pragmatic thing where, you know, I, I you know, programmed a little bit here and there, like you know, in, the, in middle school and high school. So I had some familiarity with it. And I was like, this is something that I could actually do and I don't have to wear a suit. Um, so I sort of, you know, with it, sort of with any career decision, you have some, you know, some ambition, some skill and some luck. And I got a, a job doing like managing servers and then writing PHP and JavaScript and then Ruby. Um, and then I never, I, I always found object oriented programming, like the modeling a bit difficult to understand. It, it didn't, I mean, I, it, it's just harder to, to reason about for me, at least um, maybe that's biased because of like a lot of courses I took in college. But then when I started with Elixir, and it was actually closure first for functional programming. It just made it much more uh, clear and easy to understand. Um, so, but by the time I was studying, you know, by the time I was you know, learning closure and Elixir and interested in functional programming, I'd already been able to, you know, establish the a sort of baseline life and career so I could pay off my student loans and then I could, you know, move up on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs to be more particular about what job I what job or language I would take um, take next. So I think, you know, depending on your situation in life, if you need you should make sure that you have your material things squared away first. And if that means that learning, writing Java or Go or C Sharp or whatever that might be, then you should of course do that. And then practically when you have those things or your career established, then you have more latitude to do, to do what you want and to move, to move where you want. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's, it's not an easy question. It's not an easy answer or maybe not an answer that people want to hear because you, you want to, especially if you have some sense of, like a life's work as programming and a life's work with Elixir for whatever reason, then it's going to be harder to say, well, I should just do Ruby or, or go for a few years and then I'll be able to switch back. But I think that's probably the more practical um, approach at this point. Hopefully it'll change. Yeah. Um, and then one of our last questions here that we have uh, from the community questions before we move into Q and A um, is what do we think the community needs to increase Elixir adoption? Let Ben start this one. Oh, yeah, I mean, this is not a very, this is a, a tough question because it's, you know, like sort of um, piggybacking on, on my last answer, like you need to have more, more jobs available so that you can have a bigger talent pool and they can also, you know, work as developers or maybe start their own companies. And this, you know, so this takes a long time. And I think if you look, I think uh, at Ruby, Ruby and then Rails' growth, it took quite a while uh, for, you know, Ruby and Rails can become ubiquitous. Um, so I think it, that's part of it just takes time. Um, and, you know, Elixir is definitely picked up. Um, and I think one of the, one of the thing, one of the, convers the, the conversations that has come back, you know, at, at multiple jobs and with multiple people is the sort of first class language support that Go and others have. And of course, Go is backed by Google's and all these other things. And I, I like these scrappy sort of small team that, that, that's driving Elixir and, and, and that, that appeals to me on some sort of underdog fundamental level. Um, but I, it would be nice, and I don't know if this is just a matter of like pulling different levers to advertise this, but if you go to like, you know, some, if you're using Kafka, like which Kafka library should you use? Should you use Broad, should you use Kafka X? And it doesn't even have to be that, that um, uh, opinionated, but just if you're able to go to like, to, to Confluence website and you see that they recommend this driver for Java, this driver for C Sharp or whatever. And then, oh, here's the one that we recommend for Elixir and here's the one we recommend for Erlang. Um, and I know that's not an easy thing to do, um, but I think using open telemetry as an example of like a, of a success story is really great because like, I, you know, I think Tristan Slaughter started with the open census before open telemetry and open, open tracing merged and then uh, the, the, I think it's the observability working group under the EEF is we're driving all that open telemetry work. And now if you go to open telemetry, I think .org or .com, uh, you can see that Elixir and Erlang are first class citizen. And so I think that is like a, a really nice example of how you can make that, um, a, like make that, take that from sort of start to finish. Um, and also it, it's just not, it, it's, it's not easy to maintain uh, an open source project, especially something as fundamental as Kafka or gRPC or these kind of things. And having some sort of umbrella support is, I think, really helpful. 
Yeah. And just to add to that, I agree with all of that um, for sure. I think another thing that we can help um, do is just all of us out there who are, who are, I mean, we're all technically content creators uh, who, who write books and who write blog posts, just continue to create training resources. I know that when I first started, I didn't see a lot of really great intro to, or like beginner to Elixir kind of content out there. Every book I picked up, I looked at the first page and it was like, this assumes, you know, a little bit of Elixir. And I was like, okay. Um, and then I would move on to the next thing. Um, I think now there are more, but just, you know, continue creating training resources. Um, if you're in a position to hire, please, please, please consider hiring juniors and, and other diverse groups in, in that kind of regard, because it is just, um, I just want to challenge you to reevaluate the way you're thinking about your project if you think you can only get it done with seniors. I truly just want people to think about that because I think that you can you can get the job done with the wider group of people and the more people we bring in, that is how you get people to adopt Elixir. Um, and then I guess the, the last piece that I really just wanted to talk about is just having um, more general conversations with people. Um, I noticed that on the Elixir Wizards podcast, like we definitely talk about Elixir, but we talk about other things. We've talked about Ember, we've talked about machine learning. Um, and then we've talked about people's crazy sports hobbies and their favorite food, you know, have conversations with people like they're humans, not like they're Elixir machines. Um, just, you know, having these kind of conversations with your friends and then they can uh, kind of listen in and be interested in the language. It's just always nice when you're entering a language to know that you're entering into uh, a community as well. So that's just always kind of my thought about that. And one thing that also is not really adopting Elixir or Erlang as such, but it's interesting to see now that, you know, Erlang is becoming like, a, I don't know if resurgence is the right word, but um, definitely the Elixir and Erlang are, are, are becoming more talked about now for, you know, many reasons. And I think one of the interesting things is how different languages are adopting some of the, uh, some of the concepts that the Beam have had for, for years, um, you know, like there's like three or four different Rust implementations of, of the Beam virtual machine. And I think that's really cool because, you know, at some point you're going to get something new and unexpected when you take two things and put them together in a new way. And so I think that's an exciting sort of synthesis that you wouldn't have without this, without this community driving it. Yeah, and, and this probably also starts with er, with Erlang itself, and you know you have uh, Clojure and Lural and all of these other um, implementations of different languages on top of the Beam. And so while that isn't exactly an answer of like, oh, how is this going to create more Elixir jobs or more of this? I think having these ideas that uh, synthesize with other communities is also really exciting, um, and hopefully will you know, feed back into um, Elixir and Erlang as well. And one more, one quick ask for everyone before we move into Q&A is just um, also in addition to opening up the door for more folks, if you are using Elixir in production of any kind, if you have a case study to write, please write it. Um, a lot of businesses, um, I know like mine at SmartLogic, we, we certainly would love to write our case studies about how um, something has gone. The more case studies that are written for Elixir, the more resources and more research people have to point to when they're trying to convince their higher ups that Elixir is the right move. So if you are effectively using Elixir and it's working out really well for you, please write a case study. It helps um, pay it forward, essentially. Cool. So, and should um, we move into Q and A? Sure. Um, I think uh, we'll start. I think this is a pretty good one to start with. Um, it's also in hiring, how do you reassure candidates that you'll train them up on Elixir, especially women tend to feel like we need to hit all the bullet points before applying for a job? I think that's a very good thing for both the candidate to ask in an interview. Um, I know at my first interview for a job that I knew I would be using Elixir, I was, I was very upfront. I said, I don't know Elixir. Um, and are you going to train me on it? And they were just very confident and said, yeah, we're, we're going to, you know, pair program and we have a bunch of stuff that we'd like you to take a look at. Um, there are good ways to do this, to go actually about doing this. Uh, usually if you give your candidate or when you've got your new hire, give them a quick win in the first week. Um, usually having your engineer make a PR within the first day or three days, even if it's small, even if they updated a readme, it's a really good way to integrate them into the, the ecosystem. Um, so that's usually like a really fun way to do it. Um, when you're still interviewing, um, 
just do whatever you can to, to make sure that they know that um, training is focused, is, is, a, is a focus point of your company, if it is. Um, if you have any kind of training resources, if you have a conference budget or a training budget um, that you provide your engineers per year, um, please let them know. Uh, that's always nice information for, for people to have up front. Yeah, I, I think uh, especially if you, um, I think uh, where you feel like you need to hit all the bullet points before applying for a job. Um, I mean, I understand that sentiment very well because yeah, I've, I often will read description and be like, oh, I would never, never be hired for this job. Um, but the worst thing you can do is apply and, and go through the process and, and not get a positive outcome. But even in, even going through the process will make you comfortable with, make you, well, over time will make you more comfortable. Like I, I generally do not, I don't think anyone likes interviewing, but I especially don't like interviewing and I'm not, not really a great inter interviewee. Um, so I can, uh, yeah, so I relate to this very much, um, but I guess I, I, I guess I'm doing okay because, you know, I continue to be employed. Um, so I think that there's, there's also a big gulf between like what the interview is and what the job will be. Um, like I also intentionally, and this, I think this might also, this might be harder if you, you know, if, if you're just starting out your career earlier on in your career, but like, I'll, I'll just filter out jobs that ask for a whiteboard type stuff. Like I have no problem, you know, pair programming or doing code reviews or, you know, system design or these kind of things. But if you're like, do this, you know, algorithm on a board and then, you know, do you actually use this you know, on Probably your day-to-day exactly -day stuff? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've never done that, actually, but I should. I, I'm probably just, I would probably just fumble around and then be like, all right, well, I guess this isn't going to work out. Um, but you know, you and you can self-select for you know what could be bad interviews. Um, but I would say just apply. Like the worst thing is you have a bad outcome, um, and even if even if it's a bad outcome, you learn something about it, and hopefully, you know, find ways to practice it, or or you can also just practice with friends and do mock interviews. I think. It's also a nice way to do that. Absolutely. I just realized um, we, uh, so that question was from Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mackenzie. Um, I think we can let people unmute themselves. So the next question is from Sophie. Uh, Sophie, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, hey guys. I feel like we actually talked a little bit about this, uh, Sunday you and I, when I hung out with you guys on Elixir Wizards recently, but I feel like I've seen teams who are brand new to Elixir be really productive with it really quickly. And so I'm curious from your experience or from the experience of uh, other folks that you've had on the show, have other people found that to be the case? And like, what is so amazing about Elixir that lets this happen? I think that they have found that case. Um, I think there's a, a several things in there. It's really easy to spin up an Elixir project. Um, there's not as much or like the, the grander term of it, red tape involved with deploying a production Elixir app and having it work well and just kind of hang out and work forever kind of situation. I've talked to a lot of people who said that they had built an Elixir app like six, seven years ago for a client and it's still running somewhere in the wild. They don't touch it anymore. It's just still there, it's still working. So um, it's just one of those things that's like really nice about Elixir. Um, ben can probably speak more to this, but that's what, I, what we heard a lot on the podcast this season. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's generally been my experience, you know, in both jobs that I've worked with Elixir. Um, and I think I think part of that is is the forgiving nature of of the beam, and that you know you you can have errors, and the servers will restart, and you can also track those and sort of and work through those over time. And it's actually been interesting because even though uh, you know in some we uh, we being the CTO, William King, decided from the start that we were going to use Elixir as sort of our distributed systems application language. And then we would use uh, Go on, you know, sort of the uh, pop side of things. And even within the company, we've, we ended up having like a few uh, talks about why we use Elixir. Um, and I think um, it was interesting to see that even at the company, while we're using this language, people weren't understanding why we were why we were using it, and so we were able to go through and we were talking. We were able to talk about some of the the ways that we were quickly able to prototype and then get things up. And then I think the let it crash thing, uh, you know, which is of course you could go to Sydney Erlang or Elixir talk, um, was quite uh, a funny thing for people to wrap their heads around. Even people on the Elixir team, since they hadn't programmed in Elixir or Erlang before, they're like, "Wait, shouldn't I try to catch this error? Or shouldn't I do this? Wait, why do you want to crash?" And it's like it's not about crashing; it's about restarting to a good state. And, and because of you know, these highs and bugs and uh, these, you know, one in a million or one in a billion type 
type errors. Um, so I, I, so that sort of a long-winded way of saying that, you know, um, the properties of the virtual machine and the sort of the supervision structure make it uh, optimal for, for people learning how to use this language. Um, and also the fact that, you know, it's a compiled language, so you can spot some errors pretty quickly um, that you can't do in, in, in non-compiled languages so easily. I also think it, it's probably mildly tangential, but also related to something I, I meant to mention earlier is a lot of the companies that we talked to on the podcast mentioned that hiring for Elixir gave them a competitive advantage in the hiring space. Um, I briefly touched on that, but the reason that they said that was true was because when they were looking for a pool of engineers, it narrowed their, their pool down so that they could really look at people who were very passionate and very excited about their, not just their product maybe, but also just like excited about the technology. Sometimes engineers who are um, working in a few other languages and they're just sort of looking for a job, um, maybe they're not as committed or maybe they're not as excited. Um, I can't speak to that specifically, but a lot of the, the companies that they were, um, they were always hiring great people because of the nature of how much the, their candidates really wanted to work in Elixir. Um, so that could be another thing to point to when you're talking about like how quickly they're able to ramp up and just like how it's super productive. I, usually the engineers are just super excited to be able to work on Elixir at work and not as their side gig anymore. So I think that's probably another factor. Yeah, that's, I mean, definitely hiring at, at Bleacher Report was, you know, you're using Elixir, oh, we really want to work, work for you because, you know, like I don't care about sports, I've never cared about sports, but I really wanted to work with Elixir with like a, you know, a pretty, you know, big production system. Um, and so that was, a, you know, really rewarding experience at, at BR, um, even though I don't care about the sports side. Um, and that was that was a, a good filter because if people wanted to apply, they were either interested in learning the language or they already knew some of the language. Um, and so they were able to wrap up pretty quickly. And I think also part of it was, uh, you know, so I think to like the team's credit um, was since we had no idea what we were doing with the language, we very quickly decided, well, we need to have some sort of standards in place. And and so we were able to build those um, as we went along. So services became much more predictable. Um, and uh, even like th things like monitoring and alerting and all these became part of the actual process of the service. So. Um, it became, it was much easier to be like, okay, well, I have this service, I need this database or this type, and then, you know, it's more of a checklist. And so you focus on the business logic of the, of the application rather than like, how do we do this or how do we do that? Um, so that, that was really helpful. I mean, of course, now we have, you know, Credo and these other tools that make it uh, even like mixed format, because before mixed format, it was like, how do you, how do you, how do you do this? And there are lots of arguments about that, but now, you know, mixed format, I don't really care how it looks, it just works. And then you don't have to talk about it. The same with Credo for the most part. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question, Sophie. Um, I'm looking, yeah. Emma, to see a time check. I think we're almost at time, but if we have time for one more question, we'll take the next one. Yeah, um, yeah I think we're at time, but I mean, we can take one more. Uh, I guess until, until we get kicked out. I think you can do one more question. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, the, the, uh, it moved around on me. I wasn't sure which one. Uh, ben, why don't you take um, the next one? Okay, I was just did, just uh, did the one with the the most number of votes. So uh, I guess this is from Sophie as well. Do you want to read this one? Yeah, sure. I'm back. Um, yeah, so I feel like one of the things I've seen when trying to advocate for Elixir adoption is less like, eh, we don't want Elixir because, as you guys have said, people are so excited about it, but more this problem that isn't specific to Elixir, but it's we've got this monolith and we're not sure if we can invest the time and the resources into start into starting to peel things out of it. So curious if you guys have heard or experienced anything on that topic. And then again, is there anything about Elixir that makes it uniquely well suited to solve that problem? I, mean, uh, I think VR is a good example of, of that because we did have, well, like we then at that point in time had a, um, a pretty old monolith and again, this is part part luck as well because it happened to be like a sort of a, a, a one group of people left and one group of people came in, and so it was like we literally have no idea how this thing works. So like if, if we we don't know what these Redis instances do, these these various things, we don't know how these this code ties together. So the only way for us to move forward is to start pulling it apart. Um, and it also happened that that, that we sort of we were like, well, well, we'll just do a proof of concept in Elixir um, and have a discrete 
piece of functionality that we can pull out. It happened to be a pretty important part of the system, but it performed really well. So we were able to move forward with that. So, I mean, I think generally just find like a small chunk that you can take out um, some sort of discrete functionality that either you or your team understands. And we also had what worked out really well for us because we couldn't, you know, we had all these iOS and Android apps in, in the wild and we couldn't recall those um, or issue. We couldn't sunset legacy apps at the time. So we ended up having another service that basically translated the new Elixir service back to the legacy service. Um, so we had this gem that that did that for us and it worked really well and it didn't add hardly any overhead at all because it's just basically just taking i mean of course you have the network and stuff but but for the most part it worked out really well um so i guess in one sentence you know one line like small iterative chunks yeah i mean that's and, what and you I have to have a need for it too i think sorry yeah yeah i mean i was just going to agree with you an mvp is usually kind of the move um taking the core functionality and rewriting it in elixir is usually a good gut check to see if this is something that will make sense to spend money on and move forward with um, maybe a, like a two week sprint of just running for running at it, uh, taking out the, the biggest piece of core functionality and seeing if you can replicate it easier, faster, cheaper, all of those things um, with less pain, less headache. Um, another way that people have mentioned it, I have coworkers who will kill me for saying it. Uh, sometimes you can write microservices. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, people have, you know, talked about peeling off chunks of the, the monolith and replacing it with microservices that kind of called to, to replace that functionality over time. Um, I think it's a lot to manage. I don't necessarily recommend, like if you don't have to go microservice, I wouldn't. Um, but in the, in the section where we're talking about specifically legacy monoliths, it can be another tactic in which to integrate Elixir in without totally removing or breaking apart your monolith hall. Yeah. yeah, I think moving toward a service oriented architecture is really the only way that you can do that because you can't just in place replace the monolith, right? Yeah, So you definitely don't uh, want to build the whole thing over again and then turn yeah. it on. Iterative yeah. chunks for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for your question, Sophie. Appreciate it. 